My name is Tony Hanna, and I am the Executive Director of the Redevelopment Authority of the City of Bethlehem, and have been for the past eight years. Uh, before that, I spent uh, 12 years as Director of Community and Economic Development for the City uh, as well. Uh, so I've got about a, almost a 20-year career here in the city. that the debates about the casino were really sort of centered on, on, on two things. Um, what Bethlehem was, what, how, how everybody perceived the city, um, you know, with its religious roots, its religious founding, um, the fact that people felt it was introducing something like gaming was almost anathema to the, the community's soul. Um, but we felt, we meaning the city administration, uh, the mayor, myself, and others who were involved in redevelopment, community development, uh, we felt like uh, if preservation goals really wanted to be maintained at the Bethlehem Steel site, because really this thing had to be placed in the context of not just the city of Bethlehem, but also the context of redeveloping and in fact preserving some of the history of the former Bethlehem Steel site. Uh, and there was a lot of debate about that as well. There were some people who said, just tear it all down. It, it, it brings back bad memories. Um, it's just a symbol of a failed company, uh, despite the fact that it was a company that had been around for almost 100 years and was an integral part of what made Bethlehem Bethlehem. Back in 1999, uh, Bethlehem Steel Corporation helped the city of Bethlehem craft something called the Tax Incremental Financing District. A complicated concept, but one that's pretty simple. You take your base real estate taxes, and in our case it was almost zero because Bethlehem Steel was closed, um, and then any new increment of real estate tax would be thrown into the fund and could be used for reinvestment. Well, infrastructure certainly is one of the one of the key things in tax incremental financing districts. When when you create them, they have to be created with a reason, and several reasons were given. Number one, it was uh, site remediation because it was a brownfield site. The second uh, reason was that there was no infrastructure there because it was an industrial site that didn't have a road network, it had an internal road network, but not one that you could then introduce the public onto. Um, so the creation of a new road network, we created a new street, First Street, we created second, recreate Second Street, and then obviously the re redoing Third Street, adding new parking lots, um, lighting, power, um, sewer water, uh, you, you name it, all the infrastructure things that are necessary. And the road network, obviously, uh, instead of having zero taxes generated where the, where the uh, casino sits, it's almost $16 million a year in taxes, and 85% of that stayed in the, in the fund, and we used that money, we meaning the Redevelopment Authority, who were administering the, the TIF fund, we used that money to basically invest in infrastructure, we invested in the Beth Works site in, in the form of steel stacks, um, and the creation of this arts and cultural campus to essentially balance off what was happening at the, at the Sands uh, with the casino. We believed that we needed more, more than just a, a, a gaming site there. It was a large site. And so the other aspects of the site plan were to try to in introduce housing, uh, other commercial uses, obviously arts and culture. We wanted to create a, a sense of place. And I think in Steel Stacks, we really started to use some of the lessons of placemaking. Um, and when you really look at the successes of the campus, we really did create a sense of place between arts, culture, music. Uh, retail that's coming along, coming along the way on 3rd Street. Um, obviously, we shouldn't forget about Northampton Community College, which was an early investor in the Bethlehem Works site uh, by putting in their, um, uh, their, camp, their Fowler campus, or their Southside campus. They sort of helped to create a place where people could be trained, where the neighborhood come, could come for an education. Uh, it was very walkable. So I, I think there's 
some really interesting lessons and some really interesting uh, benefits from not only the casino, but then what the casino revenue did to help us create some other things there. But we also built some public facilities that you could almost treat like public parks. The Levitt Pavilion is a public venue. It's operated by Arts Quest, but it is a public venue that we own, the authority owns, and we, um, we built that with TIF funds. And then the Hoover Mason Trestle which is almost like the piece de resistance in terms of the, the creation of a public space. But ultimately, we'd like to have it connect to the Sands building. So the trestle used to go all the way over to the ore yard where the Sands is built. Um, but that, we created, again, another public place to essentially allow people to learn about the site, uh, to access, uh, I think, history a little better than they were able to access it, get closer to the blast furnaces. And uh, we use it as a, as, it's a public park. So uh, it's a linear park. 40 feet off the ground, but it's still a public park. The original master plan for Betham Steel for that site, as part of the whole Act Two thing, that was the ore yard, probably one of the more compromised, dirtiest portions of the brownfield. That's where the ore was star stored. There was a big ore crane you see, which has the sand's name on it right now. But there was a crane that used to just basically load up cars, take iron ore, coke, and um, limestone, and basically move that on the ore cars, take it down to the blast furnaces, and turn it into steel. Um, so that's where they stored all the raw materials, and that's where some of the dirtiest material on the site was really stored. Um, the original Bethlehem Steel master plan was essentially to take that site and turn it into a parking lot, just encapsulate it, put a asphalt top over it, turn it into a huge parking area, and then run shuttle buses that would really service the Beth Work site. That was our plan. That was the cheapest and simplest way to remediate what was the most, one of the most compromised portions of the site. To make a long story short, what, what we convinced Sands to do was to consider that site for the casino, and that's what they did. But in so considering it, they had to invest an excessive amount of money in, in cleanup and in something called dynamic compaction because you had to compact the soil enough to essentially allow a hotel, retail, and the casino to get built on it. But they took the worst, one of the worst portions of the Bethlehem Works site and turned it into the casino, allowing the rest of the site to essentially get developed uh, the way it's getting developed now. They invested $800 million, a little over $800 million in the development of the casino, and probably 10 or 12% of it was just site prep, site remediation, just getting it ready for the development. So they have to be given some credit there, and they allowed us then to have the remest of the site. Instead of it being a parking lot, it's now the tax generator, it's the tax engine, and the, and the economic development engine for the site. I think I think they lost interest in Bethlehem. And obviously they lost it enough to want to sell a casino. Uh, but I think they lost interest in Bethlehem and I think the Bethlehem model. We were kind of an outlier for them uh, when they first developed this. But as an outlier, uh, I think they looked at it as a example of what you can do in terms of industrial redevelopment and use casino gaming as, an as, a, as a way to redevelop a property. And I think they thought that was going to be their model, maybe in Eastern Europe, where there were a lot of closed industrial facilities, other parts of the United States. Um, and then for them, Asian gaming came along. Um, and I think their interests really started to focus much more on the Far East, uh, much more on China, Macau, where gambling was exploding. And their investments, they and other casinos, but in particular Sands, they, they, they probably made the most significant investment in in uh, Macau uh, when it became available for outside investment. Um, and once they did that, I think that between their investment in Las Vegas and obviously their investments in the Far East, um, Bethlehem became not just an outlier, but became this almost this anomaly.